thank you. Um, yeah, so technology background, lots of software startup kind of activities. Uh, I had the pleasure of ringing the bell or being part of the team that rung the bell at the New York Stock Exchange. And the number one question I'm always asked is, Chris, um, how do you get from high tech into farming? And um, I'll tell you, it was Michael Pollan's fault. I read The Omnivore's Dilemma back in 2006 or so. And it kind of filled me with three thoughts. Uh, it, it filled me with fear, frustration, and opportunity. Um, the fear, right? We live in a system of food that is, that is making us sick, right? Um, obesity, diabetes, heart disease are all food-related diseases. Um, there's a lot of talk about cancer, there's links to autism, lots of societal health issues that just plain scare me. Um, the threats to the environment with the way we farm scares me. The frustration is that um, um, food and agriculture has become so powerful and so um, monopolized, if you will, that they've got the rest of the world or the rest of the country and our leaders convinced that this is the only way to feed the world, right? Hey, I'm sorry we have to pollute the universe and we have to kill people to do it, but um, this is the only way we're going to feed the world. And then there's the opportunity part of it, right? I learned that in Indiana we eat $17.8 billion worth of food a year, but we, um, we import 97% of that food. Right? So, you know, we have this agricultural state, but we don't have any food. There's a famous study by Dr. Ken Meter. Um, it's called Finding Food in Farmland, and it's all about Indiana and basically how messed up this whole system is. And um, as an entrepreneur, you know, you think, wow, if there's $18 billion on the table here and everyone thinks there's only one way to do this, there's probably a lot of other ways to do this. If I can't scrape a hundred million or a billion dollars out of this pie, then I'm not a very good entrepreneur. So, you know, tackling those three problems, I set out to, to really do two things at the same time. The first was um, get involved in the food business and get my hands dirty, so to speak. We, um, I purchased a farm, Tyner Pond Farm, we're in Hancock County, and I started turning corn and soybean land into pasture. And I started raising cattle and beef and chickens. And um, what I wanted to see was, can we, in fact, compete with the factory system for animals doing it a different way, without drugs, antibiotics, confinement, that sort of thing, without the pollution, chemicals, all of that? And the answer, of course, was yes. Um, we ran into the same thing with another company we started called Husk Foods. Husk makes basically produce, and we thought, boy, the poor farmer who's growing sweet corn is stuck growing enough sweet corn that he can sell during the season. And if we can help that farmer grow a crop year round, well, not only will he have five times more corn to sell, but you know, we'll make this product available to everyone year round. And so that business took off and we're about four years old. Um, but in both cases, we ran into a distribution problem, which I'll talk to in a minute. The next thing I did, or simultaneously, was if we're talking about feeding the world, who are we gonna feed and who are these people and how do they feed themselves today? So over the last five or six years, I've been to Kenya twice, I've been to Peru, I've been to Ecuador. Just two weeks ago, I got back from an agricultural trip in Cuba and I went to China. And I learned a lot from both of these experiences, um, trying to figure out where the problem was. And when I went to these other countries, one of the things I noticed was there are no grocery stores. Um, even in China, um, you know, the Chinese, they typically buy, even in urban areas, they buy in wet markets, open air markets. Um, and you walk into these modern buildings and there is this open air bazaar, right? And there are individual vendors and they have their vegetables, but they have their meat just hanging there. No refrigeration, no flies. The group I was with was appalled. Oh my goodness, look at that. And um, you know, the guide was like, are you crazy? Like, I know who this person is and I know what meat is supposed to touch and feel and smell. And if this vendor sells a bad piece of meat to anybody, everybody's gonna know about it. So he has to be on his game all the time, right? She said, we trust this. What we don't trust is the grocery store, right? Where you seal it in a package and you, you hide it from us. And isn't it true you can inject carbon monoxide in meat to make the color bright red so it looks like it's fresh when it might not be fresh? And yeah, yeah, all of that. So what the Chinese are doing is they're leaping over. It's almost like in Africa when they, when they got cell phones and they leapt over landlines, right? You know, they went from no communication to cell communication without ever installing landlines. The Chinese are leaping over wet market, no grocery store, online buying, right? Everything they do, especially the millennials, is online. Why do they do it? Well, they like the convenience of it, but also there's a much higher trust factor. You know, Chris Anderson, one of the founders of the TED, 
um, invented or created or coined the term the long tail, right? The grocery store controls what you buy, and the entire infrastructure supports the grocery store. If you think about why do we even have grocery stores, it's a uniquely American phenomena. No other country buys food the way we do, right? And we're going to try and export this farming method without the grocery store. It's not going to work. Um, we have a grocery store because we came back from World War II and we did one thing really, really well, right? Logistics, right? We became logistics masters. We could ship stuff in two wars and five million troops and trucks and tanks and food, and we really learned logistics well, as well as we learned this concept called economies of scale. The bigger things are, the cheaper we can make them. The other amazing thing that happened that is uniquely American is TV and national media, right? Before World War II, radios were local, right? Newspapers, magazines for the most part were local, billboards obviously were local. When we got TV, we suddenly got this national media, and at the same time we got TV, we got national magazines like Good Housekeeping went national. And suddenly they created this imagery of national products that should be available to everyone, right? So we consumers coveted those products and we wanted the exact same thing in California that we got in New York that we got in Alabama. That created the grocery industry, right? And it narrowed it down. And it, over the last 50 years or so, it's gotten narrower and narrower and narrower. So only a few products can make the cut, and everybody else is locked out of it. And we consumers have no choice, right? We can only get what the grocery stores decide we need. Long tail again, right? If I can bring all this online, like the Chinese, then I have this unlimited choice. Just like nobody out there, I'm guessing, is going into Best Buy to buy a DVD anymore, right? I'm guessing that nobody in this room had a Bud Light this week. Anybody have a Bud Light this week? Right. But every one of you ate a Tyson product this week, I can almost guarantee it, unless you're a vegetarian. Every one of you ate a product from Kraft, right? Or something that's owned by Pepsi or Coca-Cola. There's only four or five food companies left, and, and we're stuck with them. If we can get this all online, eliminate the grocery store, and that's really my epiphany here was, the enemy isn't the CAFO, the enemy isn't Monsanto, those are just symptoms of a disease called the grocery store that we have to try and eliminate. And there are three things, and I'll leave you with this, that will, that will, um, that will make that happen. The first is social media and, and internet marketing. You know, when I started Exact Target and then Compendium, and, and I'm heavily involved in Facebook now, you know, that was marketing democracy. I didn't need a third party to carry my message to my customers now. So on Tyner Pond Farm, we have over 17,000 Facebook likes. We have over 5,000 emails, right? I only need 5,000 customers. I mean, well, believe me, if I had 5,000 customers, I'd be flying in a jet plane today. It's a, um, you know, so that marketing democracy is going to empower direct marketing to consumers. The next thing is cheap e-commerce, right? Tools like Shopify that enable us to um, easily create up e-commerce sites so that you can find us and buy from us. And then the third thing, and this is just barely coming, and this is really going to be the, the pivot that will tip the scale in favor of online ordering for groceries, is the Uberization of everything, right? Now that we have kind of this gig economy and lots of people who will drive, you know, Uber just announced an integration to Shopify. I mean, I, my engineers are working right now on rebuilding my site so I can Uberize and you can get food from Tunner Pond in two hours. But those things are going to make it seem quaint and silly that we ever went to the grocery store. You know, I, I imagine uh, some future grandchild that I don't have yet sitting up on my lap like my grandfather telling me about walking 12 miles to school in a snowstorm. And, you know, you did what, Grandpa? You got in a car, you drove someplace, had to find a parking spot. You shuffled two acres through a parking lot in all kinds of weather. You found a cart. You wheeled it up and down aisles, not knowing if the products you want would be there or you could only buy what they told you to buy. Then you had to go like run back and forth and find the shortest line. And you had to take the stuff out of the cart and put it on a thing. Then you had to put it back in the cart. Then you had to put it back in your car. Then you had to take it to your house. You touched this stuff six or seven times before it got to your cupboard. I mean, the whole idea sounds ridiculous to the future baggage generations, right? Um, you know, so your help is start buying food online. Start buying food online from local people, right? Because if we break the grocery stores, we break this entire supply chain that we all seem to dislike so much. And I think we come away with a healthier society. So thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you.